Hi guys, good evening. Good evening to all. Uh, please note, we'll wait till 16 as we are expecting more participants to join. So we'll start by 610. Thanks for your patience, guys. Thank you.
Hi guys, good evening. Good evening to all and welcome you all in this emerging technology webinar on developing Delta Life table pipelines. So we'll start with the webinar now. Myself, Shaita Ali, your host for this webinar. So talking about Synergetics, so Synergetics is event sponsor for this webinar. So Synergetics Learning is India's most uh, distinguished learning company in IT technology. Uh, we are ready with our top class learning solutions that can be met to fit in the every industry across the globe. We have expansive greenfield solutions which are on screen as you can see. We have onboarding solution. Then we have reskilling solution. Then we have certification solution. Then we have certification plus add-on solution. Cloud adoption solution. Then we have architecting solution. Practice playbook solution. Latest technology training solution and emerging technology training solution and content development. So today's webinar is organized by ETC community that is emerging technology community and sponsored by Synergetics and Microsoft. So our ETC community is open to all the people who are interested in emerging technologies. Uh, so you just need to install the meetup app on your phone and follow our meetup community, which is an emerging technology community. You just need to install this app. As you can see, the scanner has been mentioned. You can scan and just follow this community to get the updates about our events, meetups, which we do. And code of conduct that you all need to follow. Please note that you are not allowed to take the screenshot of the presentation while speaker is sharing the screen and cannot do the screen recording. We'll upload this recording on our official YouTube channel. For that, you just need to subscribe to a YouTube channel. So I will share the YouTube channel link in the chat box later on. Then the agenda for the session will try to cover and the overview of this topic. Then today's speaker for this webinar is Mr. Chandrasekhar Deshpande. He is an MCT Microsoft certified trainer and practitioner. He has years of experience in delivering training on emerging technologies. Then the upcoming session uh, is on Microsoft certification, which is SC400. It will be a full free, uh, full day training, which is uh, free of cost. So I will share the registration link in the chat box. If you want to register for the same, you can do. Then do follow us on our social media platform like LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. I will share the links for the same in the chat box as well. That's all from my side. I would like to hand over the mic to the speaker now, Mr. Chandrasekhar sir. Thank you guys. Thank you. CB sir, if you are there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can go ahead, please. Uh, hello, all. Uh, very nice to see all of you here. I welcome all of you for this uh, two hours session on data live tables. Data live tables. So, actually, what exactly it is, and we will uh, try to have a look at. Uh, you know, its implementation also. We will also try to understand more about uh, Lake House. OK, what exactly Lake House and how, you know, the way it has been implemented in the form of data tables uh, in Databricks. And then the pipeline, what we will create for Delta tables, you know, that pipeline we will re-implement using Delta Lab tables. So I'm sharing my screen and would like to know when screen reaches to go to. Yes, the screen is visible. OK, and I hope I, my audio is also uh, much clear to you. Yes, yes, perfectly fine. OK.
these are a couple of points we are planning to cover today. So what exactly Delta Live table is? Brief of Lake House and Delta tables. In my previous session, I discussed Lake House uh, in detail. Lake House and Delta tables in detail. I will try to brush up those concepts because you know uh, Delta Live tables are based on uh, those concepts. Demo on implementing Delta tables. That also we will see Delta Lake architecture and the concepts. Thereafter, we will go for Delta Live table. And we will see all features of Delta Live table. And we will try to implement Delta Live tables here in this session. <clears throat> so first of all, let us understand what exactly Delta Live table is. I will come to Delta tables. OK, once we understand what exactly Delta Live table is. So Delta Live table is an ETL framework. <clears throat> Extract, transform and load. It is ETL framework for building reliable, maintainable and testable data processing pipeline. Now there are many other ETL frameworks also. There is a data breaks and there is even in data breaks also by using PySpark code. We can do ETL activity. There is a data factory also. There are many ETL frameworks. Then how this Delta Live table is different than those uh, frameworks? That is again interesting to see. Now in data bricks, you have to write the code using PySpark. And for that purpose, you must uh, have a good knowledge of PySpark. On the other hand, for Delta Live table, it is it offers you declarative approach. So somebody has already written uh, PySpark code on or over that Py, 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 PySpark code. You can declaratively define many things, okay, for which you need not have a you need not have a knowledge of PySpark. <laughs> that is one interesting thing. So declarative approach to build reliable data pipelines and task orchestration. So we will write one PySpark code. I will take you through you know, uh, the pre-written code, and then we will convert that code into a declarative approach. So how we will do it, okay? And with uh, by doing that, how you know it manages dependencies, how it manages infrastructure, and there is one more very interesting feature. It is data quality improvement. Now how we can achieve data quality also. You now all these things we will see while implementing Delta Live tables. It's a managed workflow for loading Delta tables. So it is very important to understand what exactly Delta tables are. So we will understand Delta tables first and then we will create a workflow for Delta tables. So in Delta tables, we will design ETL steps and those ETL steps we can orchestrate using Delta Live tables. So what Delta Live table can do for me? It can define table dependencies on which table, which table is depending. OK, so it means it can deal with multiple types of tables and we can define dependencies of these tables using Delta Live table. Define updating of tables. Streams. We can manage incremental updates also. We can define libraries cluster so we can you know simply configure cluster and we can leave to delta uh, delta live tables to manage that cluster we can even monitor it the entirely different kind of ui they are giving you know to monitor these clusters define transformations based on expectations now this is one uh, another interesting thing that you simply have to define uh, transformations using declarative approach. So if you use a declarative approach to define transformations, then down the line it writes code, okay, and uh, get the job done. So your uh, what we have, what we will say, uh, size of the code also goes down, and code becomes uh, much more simpler, okay, and that's why easily maintainable. Define error handling also. Whenever any error occurs, you know what to do, uh, whether to terminate the program or whether to ignore the error. 
that also we can declare. So anyway, it is an to aid uh, framework to manage workflows, specifically in case of delta tables. And now the question is, why do we need a separate workflow management for delta tables? That you will realize whenever we will work with the delta tables. OK, and there, you know, in case of delta tables, there are multiple steps to be followed. And those steps can be orchestrated using uh, those steps can be made reusable and can be orchestrated using delta live tables. I repeat again. Delta table are to be implemented through multiple steps. And those steps if are written from top to down, you know, are not reusable. So delta live table can make those steps reusable. Delta live table can orchestrate those steps. Delta live table provides infrastructure to run the tables, scalable infrastructure to run the tables. And you know all other things what are all needed to you know, orchestrate and manage workloads you know, all are provided uh, through delta line tables. Okay, enforce data quality with the delta live tables. We call it as the expectations. So how do we declaratively uh, you know, declare? Uh, how do we define uh, expectations? That also I will bring to your notice. Okay, multiple things are possible through delta live table, but more or less, you know, it is a next level of managing delta tables. So delta live table is a way next level of managing delta tables. Delta tables management, you know, uh, can be simplified using and can be made reusable using delta live tables. OK, so having understood what exactly delta live tables are, now it is the time to understand what exactly delta tables are. So delta table is an implementation of a standard called as a lake house. Data bricks introduced the concept of lake house and its implementation in the form of delta tables. And data bricks, they are really hampering on the lake house because you know, it's uh, uh, you know uh, they are the first and they are the pioneer pioneer to introduce this concept in their product. What exactly the uh, lake house is? Now, if you look at the evolution of data processing, what I can see is along back there was a flat file system you know, which was having kind of a weakness of, you know, in case if you want to search a specific uh, sorry, attributes of or record of specific entity, you know, it is very difficult, okay, in a uh, flat file system. For example, if there is, implement, there is a very large organization and uh, they are having very large cells data and we want to search Sales data of a specific day from the historical data. From, from the flat file system, it is very difficult. And to meet the need of the industry, or to meet this kind of need of the industry, then they introduce something called as RDBMS. The real reason of an RDB introducing RDBMS is to make searching of the data possible through standard structured very language. In RDBMS, what all thing, what other things we get? So we get data in the tabular structure. We call it as a table. We can establish a relationship of table among different tables. We can query these tables using structured query language. Okay, and there are different card rules and you know uh, acid properties. You know, uh, so this is basically RDBMS is basically for OLTP workload, transactional workload. You know, so transaction management also becomes a part of uh, relational database management system. So transaction management basically is for maintaining data integrity. 
and having a consistent data. So when somebody commit the record, that record becomes visible. Uh, updated record becomes visible to others. And whenever somebody is starting a transaction, you know that record gets locked and others will not be able to view the record until it is committed. So transaction management is there in case of uh, uh, RDBMS. OK, after that, then. Lake House, sorry, uh, data lake. Got introduced. Let me mention these things in one pen press so that. Flat file system. Then RDBMS. So RDBMS can manage the transactions. RDBMS can uh, be used to query your data. OK, and small part of the data also becomes very quickly searched for you. OK, but RDBMS has proprietary data formats. Proprietary data formats means you know data in the different formats you know, working with the data in the different formats is not possible in RDBMS. So it supports support proprietary. Data formats. Formats. So in order to deal with the different data formats, in order to deal with the different data types. Then uh, del, uh, sorry, data lake got introduced. Data lake. So here you can store the files and your data in different data formats. So it may be CSV data, it may be JSON data, it may be XML data. You know, different data formats can be represented here. And data lake basically is for a big data analysis. It is basically for big data analysis. OK, in RDBMS, in order to deal with complex queries, in order to deal with very large data size, then they introduced the concept of data warehouse. Data warehouse. So data warehouse also supports relational database management, supports querying the data using structured query language, and also support, uh, say, maybe transactions. OK. Then they introduced a lake house to deal with a variety of the data. OK, and to deal with a variety of the data, which is very large in size. OK. Now lake house does not allow, sorry, not lake house, data lake does not allow querying the data. It does not allow querying the data. It is basically for OLAP workload. OLAP workload. OK, this is basically for OLTP workload. Hmm. And in data lake, you, know, you can deal with a variety of the data formats, variety of, uh, uh, say, different data types, OK? But what you cannot do is you cannot deal with the transactions because it is for OLAP work. Now here what happens is in this scenario, OK, whenever I want to uh, do big data analysis, OK, on historical data as well as on streaming data, OK, then this data leak falls short of. It can give me Hadoop, for example. Hadoop can give me big data analysis with a batch processing. With a batch processing, it means big data analysis of historical data. OK, so data lake. Hadoop. They can allow big data analysis on historical data. Big data analysis on historical data. OK, but they cannot do the big data analysis on streaming data. Not possible. OK, because for streaming data, very quick processing and very high read rate speed is essential. 
Okay, that is possible only if your data is in memory. If your data every time you need to or your system need to write to the disk, you know, streaming data cannot be dealt using these using these platforms. So then Spark got introduced. Spark and uh, enterprise level platform to work with Spark is data breaks. It got introduced. Okay, this can deal with the big data analysis, big data analysis. Okay, but keeping data, keeping whole big data in memory. Now that is very interesting. That you know, how Spark can manage so large data which may be running in petabytes in memory. And there comes the significance of Spark. With this now what we can do, we can work with historical data as well as the streaming data. Because whenever your data is being held in memory, then it can be processed really fast. So uh, we call it as a you know, big data processing can be you know exercised using uh, batch processing. Okay, so batch processing. Here Hadoop and uh, this thing supports only batch processing. Supports only uh, batch processing. And what kind of processing it does not support? Stream processing. But Spark can support batch and stream processing. And stream processing. Okay, with a batch and stream processing, you know, uh, data of different formats, data of different data types, irrespective of the size of the data, can be processed quickly. Irrespective of the size of the data, can be processed quickly. Okay, but what it cannot do is it cannot do transaction management. So what I can see is from the data leak, you know, up to this, a kind of a evol evolution. It is a kind of a evolution. And what thing is not in this evolution? Transaction management is not there in evolution. OK, now here there is some. Uh, uh, here there is a, another issue now. In order to work with batch and stream processing in one use case. In one use case, if we want to use a batch and stream processing both, you know, then it creates a problem. And it makes the things more complicated and difficult. In order to deal with batch and stream processing pipelines together, if they introduced something called as a Lambda architecture. And Kappa architecture. But again, Lambda architecture and Kappa architecture, you know, both these architectures are difficult to implement. Difficult to implement in the sense that you know, data integrity always remains in question. Data integrity and data consistency always remains in question. OK, and that's why in order to maintain data integrity and data consistency, you know, these architectures make the things difficult. So here we want. Data integrity to deal with properly. We want the system to deal with a different data types. We want to deal with a different data uh, formats also. And there comes the lake house. Lake house. What lake house can do? It can do batch and stream processing. Okay. Better option to Lambda and Kappa architecture, okay, because of its simplified implementation, very simple architecture, simple architecture, and simple implementation also. Implementation also. No, why the implementation has become simple, and why the implementation was difficult here? So, I told you that. The challenges here are to deal with the data consistency. 
okay and what they did here is they introduced something called as the transaction management to deal with the data consistency okay so transaction management to deal with data consistency so both these pipelines can be uh, made to interact with each other and architecture is also and implementation is also very simple and data consistency also you know becomes reliable by introducing transaction management so here they have introduced the transaction management to achieve great level and reliable level of data consistency okay so with these features now what lakehouse can do uh i already have mentioned batch and screen processing uh yes i think i have mentioned all the points here batch and screen processing both can be implemented simple architecture and yes okay so that's the way you know this whole uh, thing got evolved now let us come to the points these points So Lakehouse is a you know, specification, open data management architecture that unifies data warehousing and advanced analytics. Ah, so that point I think I, I was trying to recall. You know, so it is a unification, unification of data warehousing. In order to deal with the data warehousing, you know, what they are allowing you to do is to establish relationship among the tables to introduce a transaction management to meet the need of data the reliable data consistency and big data processing also big data processing both these things we are combining in the lake house both these things we are combining so what will be the features you know, RDBMS is offering that is also that, and whatever be the features, you know, Data Lake and Spark they are offering that is also there, and all these features are combined together under the specification Lake House. Yes, so offers data management and asset transactions of data warehouse. Storage reservoir, flexible, cost efficient, and scale the data lakes. Different data types and different data formats can be dealt from here, uh, from the data lake. Okay, enables business intelligence, machine learning on all types of data. Okay, prominent features here are its architecture is really, it's just a two tier architecture. Okay. On the other hand, you know, uh, uh, data warehousing has a three tier architecture, but here it has two tier architecture. New query engine designs enable high performance SQL analysis. They have introduced new query engines, you know, which are in, 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 uh, improving the performance of the queries and the results are getting created, responses are getting generated quicker. Any, any message if I have, let me just check. You can keep putting your questions here. Huh? Okay. Open data formats like Parkway. So down the line, it uses Parkway. Parkway offers you columnar storage, which is most suitable for analytics, analytical processing. And Parkway, you know, uh, accommodates large data in small size also by applying very effective encryption uh, techniques there. Okay, well-known and widely used libraries. It supports, you know, all types of Python libraries or non-Python libraries, TensorFlow like support audit history and time travel and other things also it support. IO streaming. Now we don't need 
you know message buses like apache kafka and uh, this uh, delta table or lake house you know can ingest the data directly from the source like iot devices into delta table so that intermediary which otherwise we need to use like apache kafka or azure event hub or I, uh, that is not needed here yes and directly you know from uh, the data source data can be consumed so it is because the processing of uh, uh, delta tables is very fast delta lake for lake house an open source project that allows building lake house architecture on the top of uh, different data lakes Delta Lake, you know, can refer to different data links like uh, HDFS, S3 of Amazon, Azure Data Lake Store of Azure, GCS, well, Google, Google Cloud Storage. Okay, uh, it allows you to use a different computes also. Here we will see how can we deal with a Spark engine. Okay, but you know, it is uh, uh, pluggable to different computes also. And as you know, these uh, Spark and Flink like computes are supporting different and multilingual support, you know, multiple languages can be used here to work with. At the heart of the Delta Lake, data is represented as a table. We call it as a Delta table. This is an in memory table you know, which can hold very large amount of data, okay, and can keep it in memory. Now remember, in case if our data is in petabytes and RAM of the memory is in gigabytes, how this whole data is accommodated there, petabyte sized data can be accommodated into gigabyte sized data. So it is not possible, okay, until that data is distributed among multiple machines, RAM of multiple machines. So here what it does is, let me show you the diagram. Here is a large data size. And we want to accommodate this whole data into RAM memory of a machine or multiple machines. Okay. So maybe large data. Large data. OK, now there are multiple machines of which RAM size is limited. If your data is say 600 terabyte of data, okay, and RAM size of these machines is not, you know, 600, but whenever we combine RAM size of multiple machines, then perhaps that whole data, 600 terabyte of data can be accommodated. So maybe here there, there are four, okay, so I am considering it has a RAM size available of 150 TB. I'm considering 150 TB. Here also 150 TB. I and mean, in every machine, there is a 150 TB. So 600 TB data is to be divided into four parts. And those, each part can be kept into these machines. Those parts are called as a partitions. So here, first partition means first chunk of 150 TB, another chunk of 150 TB, third chunk of 150 TB, and fourth chunk of 150. Okay, so those can be data can be distributed, and in that case, we call it as a distributed data set. So these data tables are distributed. These data tables are means in case if you are from Spark background, so I can tell you that these data tables are, you know, something like Spark data frame. Something like Spark data set. They are, you know, improvisation of Spark data set as a table. Improvisation of Spark data set as a table. Yes. On Spark data set, you cannot apply acid properties, but this improvisation allows you to apply acid properties on these tables. So that is delta delta table. Okay, uh, constraints, 
now these delta tables allows you to you know declare constraints joins and you know complex queries also can work over them they can accommodate the stream data on the fly and operations on them may also change the results with a fresh data complete okay in delta lake architecture there are three uh, data comes from stream you know here are different characters means these characters are nothing but computes and your data you know uh, passes through and in the three stages okay and in every stage your data gets your data gets enriched okay so in bronze uh, table then it gets enriched into silver table then it gets enriched into gold table okay and finally when it comes out of gold table you know that data is ready for creating reports is ready for creating different visuals or is ready to you know submit it to next application okay so data can be picked up from different storages also so that is the delta lake architecture and in this delta lake architecture this is a very important part which takes the data through these three different stages bronze table represents raw ingestion raw data so whenever you are ingesting the data it has to go to bronze table first then on that data you may be applying some different data cleaning and data transformation steps multiple data cleaning and data transformation steps okay so data gets transformed here you know this is the pre aggregation step okay the actual aggregation you will do in the gold layer so with the every stage you know data quality is improving okay here is a raw data and here is the last stage is the aggregated data delta lake allows you to incrementally improve the quality of your data until it is ready for consumption so bronze table contains raw data that data may come from json rdbms iot from any data source silver table will provide a more refined view of our data we can join fields from various bronze tables to enrich streaming records or update account statuses based on the recent activity so here in silver table we will refine the data by applying all necessary multiple necessary data cleaning and data transformation steps finally there is a gold table <laughs> there is a gold table finally okay this gold table provides business level aggregation often used for reporting and dashboarding you know your data gets aggregated and then becomes ready for report generation let me take you through implementation of delta lake okay for that purpose here i have a subscription okay i already have created a data bricks and in data bricks now first of all let me start the compute so here this compute let me start <coughs> Yes. Okay. So I already have told you that data has to go through three different stages. Bronze will have uh, raw data. Silver will have cleaned data, and gold will have aggregated data. So here, first of all, I am declaring the login to run this code. Okay. and uh, after that here you observe i am creating some paths on databricks file system so on databricks file system you know in uh, a specific user now user is i am the user here okay, here is a user uh, uh, there i am asking it to create one activity folder okay in this activity folder then there will be bronze and inside bronze there is a checkpoint folder inside activity there is a silver and silver inside silver there is a checkpoint folder inside activity there is a gold okay and there is a checkpoint inside that gold also okay now why do we need this table structure or sorry folder structure i already have told you that data is held data table are created in memory then why are we creating 
see the table or sorry, this folder structures on the Databricks file system. <coughs> so it is not mandatory to create this folder structure on Databricks file system. OK, but we it is the best practice to create such a folder structure so that. You know. In the every stage, whenever your in memory data gets in the reach. OK, it's a snapshot. It's. Created in this folder structure. What is the benefit of having a snapshot on the folder structure? That for any reason, if your in memory data is lost. Maybe one node runs short of memory and that's why it has to drop that data. OK, so from the snapshot, it can rebuild it. From the snapshot, it can rebuild it. So if you are coming from Spark background, this is not something new for you. OK, there is something called as the resilient distributed data set. Resilient. Resiliency is a very interesting feature of uh, you know, data frames and data sets in Spark. You know, and this particular, uh, you know, uh, 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 so snapshot, taking a snapshot, enhances the speed of this resilience, enhances performance of this resilience. OK. Uh, still, it is getting started. After it gets completely started, then we will put it. OK, that pipeline, I mean to say. Uh, the, that folder structure, I'm. Uh, emptying it, I'm deleting everything from that folder structure to get a fresh empty folder structure. So that I am doing here. OK, and then we will configure the data set. So here I have one storage. And on this storage, I have one container, data container. So let me just show you that storage here. This way I created data breaks. So you know how to create a data breaks. Storage accounts. Here it is. Here is a storage. And in this storage, I already have uploaded necessary data files. So inside a data container, you know, there are two data files we are going to use here. Geolookup.parkway. OK, and there are many data files inside this JSON. JSON folder. Delta data dot JSON. There are four. Park data files here. OK, so. These part data files we will. Uh, uh, we will use to simulate streaming data. Streaming data will come from these files. OK, that is one thing. And the second thing is historical data to come from this file. Static data to come from this file, Geolookup Parkway, and your streaming data to come from these files. OK, so those two types of files we will use here. OK, my cluster is up and ready. OK, let me put it to run now. So I'm putting this code to run. <clears throat> Thereby, I'm declaring username and uh, user group. OK, now this directory structure I'm declaring. OK, in terms of the Python variables, uh, all these are the Python variables. OK, and whenever this directory structure is not existing, it will create it. So those variables I have declared. OK, in case if that directory structure is already existing, I will have to flush it out. OK, so I am removing, deleting everything from there. OK, and it is false because nothing is there. Hereby, I am declaring the data source. Data source for. Uh, stream data. Data source for static data. And I have both these data on the same storage. That's why only one data source I am declaring. My data is in. Uh, public access and that's why I don't have to give account key. That's why this statement I have commented. But in case if your data is in private access, OK, then you will have to uncomment it. That is also done. If you look at the data, okay, here it is. 
I go inside this and I open one of the JSON file for you. OK, size is very large. I wanted to show you uh, the schema of the data, but size is really large. Let me just check whether it can open this one. I doubt because uh, it is more than 4 MB. Uh, 2.1 only, uh, 2.1 MB only. So that also I cannot show you. But anyway, here I am declaring a schema for the uh, data. These are all columns in that data. These are all columns. Okay, arrival time, creation time, device, index, model, user. Now, inside geolocation, there are two subfields. So geolocation is a uh, you know, family of these two columns. Okay, GT, ID, X, Y, Z, and other columns are there. So let me declare a schema here. Okay, in order to declare a schema, structure field, structure type, you know, these are uh, string type, long type. These are all, you know, uh, classes coming from Spark framework, PySpark framework. Yes. Okay. And now, let me trigger ingesting the stream data. Okay, format JSON and path is already being given here. OK, it will go to that storage. It will go inside this folder. OK, and it will read the files one by one. Format is JSON. Schema is enforced. OK, option max files per trigger. This this option. Control the amount of the data which is consumed with each load from the disk. So it is actually simulating the data coming from the stream. You know how much data it will bring from the stream that is being controlled with this factor. OK, so this is I'm putting and I will keep getting the records. Uh, chunk of the records, a small chunk of the records after some specific interval of time. OK, so it will keep giving me that data. So here you can see. OK, this data. Huh. Now if I want to see that data, display command can be uh, executed and I will see that data this way. So I'm putting it to run and now it has to show me the data. But remember here it is it will bring this data as a stream, so it will not bring whole data in one go. Maybe initially it will bring 100 records after some time it will bring next 100 records and all those records you know, will be automatically appended into this data frame. So here are the records. Here are the column arrival time, creation time, you know, and here are the columns. OK, and so my stream data is ready and now it is time for me in order to submit that stream data for the purpose of. Uh, to submit that to stream data to different layers. So for that purpose here, you know, first of all, I will submit that data and I will write it in the format called as a delta format, you know, into delta table. So it will now, this particular command will populate delta table. And what kind of delta table this is? It is a bronze delta table because my data is raw. It is bronze delta table. I'm putting it to run. Okay, and it will create bronze delta table in memory and it will also do one thing. It will create its. Checkpoint or it will create its snapshot in the path bronze path that has been given for checkpoint this bronze. Checkpoint this this one. Bronze check. Here it will create a snapshot. I repeat again. Your data will be existing in RAM, but its snapshot is preserved in the uh, on the disk, you know, and it will process your data which is in RAM. It does not have to refer to the snapshot data, but for any contingency, you know, if it losses data in the memory, then only it refers the data in the checkpoint. Let me put it to run. 
Yes. So it has created a bond bronze table. So it has created a bronze table and your uh, streaming data is getting appended into bronze table, so continuously getting appended into bronze table. So you will uh, see that, you know, this park job will be continuously running. OK, now next thing is now I want to make static data frame read. And for that purpose. Park read read is the command. You know, to create a static data frame. What command did we give here? To read a dynamic data frame. Read stream. It is a read stream. So read stream command is creating dynamic data frame. And from the dynamic data frame, here we have created bronze table. OK, now let me create a static data frame. So here it is, static data frame. Load geo lookup.parkway. OK, and these columns I want it to read. I'm putting this command to run, which will create a static data frame now. OK, static data frame. Huh. Now the next step. I already have bronze table created. So from the bronze table, from the bronze table, we are reading these columns. OK, and. To the static data frame, we are doing join. So we are creating another schema you know, of which these columns are from bronze table and these columns are from static data. So here I am giving or I am covering an example of join, but here you can you know, write the steps to apply different data cleaning uh, uh, steps. You can write a steps here to apply different transformations. Okay, I am covering only one kind of transformation. And assuming that my data is already clean. So I'm putting it to run. Yes. And here see. This is a data frame. You know, having some of the columns from. Bronze table and joined with the columns from the static data frame. So new. Uh, dynamic data frame is getting created here. OK, and in this dynamic data frame. The data coming from the branch table is continuously getting appended. OK, because data is coming as a stream. Now let us put that data into silver layer. So I'm assuming my data is clean. I'm assuming my data is transformed, has been transformed. And now let me move it to. Silver layer. So write the stream. This data frame we are writing in the form, uh, format delta option and output mode and other things I am mentioning. And here now it will create silver data frame. So here it will create a silver data frame. If you want to see more about it, you can see from here what are all jobs it is executing. Uh, and here also, you know, it will show you. Uh, the input versus processing rate. So in case if velocity of the incoming data is more than the processing rate, you know there you can add more nodes to the cluster so that you know uh, those things you can come to know from here. You know whether you need a more compute and whether your compute is coping up with the input velocity of the data that also you can come to know from here, but this graph will keep changing. OK, as we are dealing with a streaming data. If you see. The directory structure of silver layer or bronze layer there, you will realize that the snapshots are being taken in the form of the Parkway file. So Parkway is the default file here, default data format here. OK, now let us do aggregation. And for doing aggregation, you know, we already have created a silver layer inside which data from bronze layer as well as 
data from joint data from static uh, data source no, both are existing now let us apply aggregation on the data and here we are applying a window function where we can ask it to group by uh, window function for every uh, hour okay and get the count so count is showing me a kind of aggregation okay and after it does that aggregation i want it to write that aggregated result to the gold table to the gold table okay so let me put this command to run you know this is the last stage in delta table where now my data which had been made already after due aggregation you know for generation of the reports that data now is being uh, written into uh, gold layer that will be written into gold layer again there you will see that data is being written in the form of the parkway files okay now from the gold layer we will create uh, tables so okay here is the table now why table because now these tables will be queryable so we have to create you know, temporary views or materialized views from uh, the gold layer data okay so this table in case if it is existing let me drop it uh, and let me create you know a table with the name grouped count and this grouped count path grouped count path is a path to grouped count path is a path to the gold layer from there we are asking it to pull the data okay and create a table again i repeat your gold data is existing in the wrap now to that data it will give a wrapper queryable wrapper in the form of temporary table queryable wrapper yes and now on that table okay the name of the table is grouped count on that table we can run the sql queries so here i run this sql query and yes here is the data we are receiving from it we can create temporary view also this is, the, uh, here we have created uh, here let me create a temporary view also and we can query uh, temporary view also so temporary view we are creating with a name query table and here we can query the temporary view okay and from this temporary view or to this temporary view you can query from you know even power bi you can you know query uh, from uh, databricks sql also and you can draw different visuals over there so once your table is created you know different kinds of reports can be generated using different types of tools so reports can be generated in power bi reports can be generated into uh, databricks sql not only that this data can be submitted to machine learning you know, for training the model and doing the rest of the things so that is also possible but this is the way we have we are creating delta tables okay i am stopping it now okay and now it is the time for us to understand and work with delta live tables okay, so let me stop it now okay and let me check with you any question on this let me check with you any question on this on delta tables any question please
Am I audible there? Do you hear me? Okay. So again, coming back now, we will try to understand how this can be extended into Delta Live Dip. So I will take you to another code now. Here is another code. And in this code, if you see the initial steps, what we are following are the C. Like here we are declaring users. Here we are declaring. Uh, Say uh, what we will uh, call it as the checkpoint structure. Okay. Uh, just a minute. Okay. Okay. So same steps. I can put these steps to run. Okay, so here user is created. Just give me a minute. Huh? Somebody is calling me. Maybe something urgent. Just give me a minute. OK, let me put this command to run. Okay. And let me. Achha, achha, I think I forgot to run this command first. And then this one. And let me empty the directory structure. It is essential to empty the directory structure, checkpoint directory structure. You know, if, if it is not emptied, you know, it will throw error. That I have emptied. OK. <coughs> So these steps we already have executed. And now I would like to bring to your notice. These things. Here you observe, if you recall, these are the steps we wrote to read the data. Uh, uh, the JSON data. OK, what I am doing is that step I am putting into the function and I am declaring that function as a Delta Live table. So Delta Live table is a the declaration here. Here is a declaration. You know, uh, I can mention a comment inside it. OK, and this declaration is being given to this function. Remember. This particular step. OK, will be identified by name of the function. So click stream underscore raw. So when I run this cell, OK, it will create this step, but it will not execute this step. It will simply declare this step. And wherever we want this step to execute, and this step becomes re reusing. Wherever we want this step to execute, you know, by using this name, we can ask it to do. By using this name, we can ask it to do. So fine, the very first step what we have seen for uh, creating the uh, stream uh, data pane, that 
step I am declaring inside the function and I am giving it a declaration. OK, as a delta live table step. OK, but now one more interesting thing that these the steps I cannot execute on all purpose compute. Here I have created all purpose compute. I have to stop this all purpose compute because these the steps I will have to run as a job. I repeat again, these the steps I will have to run as a job. Now, so this general purpose cluster I am terminating from here now. Okay. This general purpose cluster I have terminated. Coming back. Huh. OK, so we will understand the steps and then we will create a Delta Live Table Pipeline and that Delta Live Table Pipeline we will uh, run as a job. OK, so this is the first step, which is, uh, uh, you know, way to uh, get the data. OK, and internally. It will create a delta live table of this. Internally, it will create a delta live table of this. OK, so this step I don't have to write. See here. Uh, this is the way we are reading the stream. OK, and uh, creating the data frame. And this is the step we are creating write stream as a delta as a bronze table. So I don't have to write it explicitly into the bronze table. You know, by default it considers it OK and writes it as a bronze table. In that care it takes internal. Now here is the step. To work with. Uh, silver layer. OK, so in this step. Uh, not silver layer. Here I am creating uh, a static data frame. I am creating a static data frame by reading the data from the parkway by. Okay, and then you see here how are we working with a silver layer. So inside this method, I think somebody is repeatedly calling me. Give me a minute. Sorry, I am extremely sorry for that. Extremely sorry. Coming back. OK, so here static data frame will be created uh, from this parkway file. OK, uh, so this tape is equivalent to uh, this tape here. OK, so uh, here. OK, so that's steep. I'm putting it to one method here. I am embedding it into one method here and I am declaring that as a uh, state, separate state. OK. Now the third thing. Third step is to create. Uh, you know, joined. Uh, data set. So hereby, you know, if you observe here. Uh, st static lookup. 
Now, what do you mean by this static loop? loop? Uh, now, I'm, uh, I would like everybody to pay attention here, okay, to understand how are we setting the dependencies here? This is a static loop. Okay, so this is Delta Live table Steam. You know, that I want to invoke here. And for that purpose, dlt.read, and I will simply mention the method name. So here what it will do, it will call this method. This method is returning uh, data frame created out of this Parkway file. Okay, and I will get that data frame reference into df2. Here why I am trying to get stream data frame. So click stream underscore raw. Okay, here it is. Click stream underscore raw. So here, this particular step will return stream data frame. Here, this particular step will return static data frame. And both those the data frames, you know, whenever I am referring here, okay, this step, which is actually creating a silver table, you know, is showing the dependency towards earlier two steps. So this is the way to establish a dependency. And here we are doing a joining of two data frames. Here we are doing a joining of two data frames and joined data frames we are returning from. So the step, what we mentioned here, okay, this step, you know, is, you know, being declared here in this way in Delta Live table. We are referring to the first uh, uh, static data frame. Hereby, we are referring to the stream data frame. Both those data frames we are joining here. Okay, and joined the data frame we are returning from here. Okay, and this method is being declared, you know, uh, as a uh, delta live table step. And now here you see expectations. Okay, if time permits, I will. I don't discuss more on expectations, but this is a way to declare the expectations. If you try to understand, you know, hereby what I am asking it to refer to this column, okay, and select only those rows from the data set for which this column is not having. So select those rows from the data set. So this is the way to apply the cleaning of the data. I don't have to apply a step to you know, Py, PySpark step to search for the data which is not clean. Uh, sorry, search for the data which is not clean. Okay, hereby I am asking it to you know, uh, give me a clean data. Okay, so data cleaning can be applied this way in Delta Live tables. We will put more light on. Uh, this data cleaning if time permits us. OK. So here we will get a silver layer. And again, I repeat. I don't have to explicitly deal with these layers now. It will automatically take care of working with these layers. In Delta, line, Delta tables, we have to explicitly work with the layers. See, this way we will have to append them or we will have to persist them. OK, here we don't have to do that. It takes care of uh, persisting them uh, into RAM, okay, in memory persistence as well as persisting as a snapshot on the disk. It will take care. Yes. And then this last is gold data frame we are working with. Yes. Okay. And here we are uh, doing the aggregation. Here we are doing the aggregation. How do we run these steps now? That is very interesting. You cannot run these steps on general purpose cluster. For that purpose, you have to create workflow. So I'm going to the workflow. Delta live tables. The separate uh, tab is available to create Delta live table workflows. There I'm clicking. I'm creating a new pipeline. Here it is. Pipeline name, name, maybe Delta Live Table uh, PySpark. Okay, 
I have to here multiple options are available poor, pro, and advanced. I will have to go with the advanced because you know ex expect uh, 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 declaration we are mentioning there, and that expectation is possible in advanced. It is not possible in pro and poor. It is possible in advanced. Uh, from here, I will have to select the notebook which I want to run. So I will select the notebook to which we had a loop. It is 203. Uh, here it is. Uh, OK. And rest of the things I don't have to you know, bother about. Achha, compute, I will have to bother about. OK, enhanced auto scaling. No, I want it to go with a fixed size. OK, and my, let me reduce the size to two. And that's all. Let me click on create. OK, and what it will do now, it will create a job for this. It will create a cluster. And on to that cluster, it will submit the job and it will run all these steps. So here you will see the steps here. You will see the log also, and here you will see all other details. So I have to start um, creating this workflow by clicking over here. So I'm clicking over here. <clears throat> okay, now it has to provision the resources. Okay, I I don't remember whether I have shut down. Uh, yes, I already have shut down all purpose compute. So uh, because I have limitation on SKUs, okay, I have to shut down that all purpose compute because now it will start job cluster. So it is waiting for getting the, the resources provision. In the meantime, let me take you through other steps, uh, sorry, other slides. In data live table concepts, we have created a pipeline, okay, and we have set the dependencies over there. We have set the dependencies over there. So let me show you the dependencies, what we have set. Okay. Here you observe. Huh. This read and this read, you know, they are setting the dependency of this method over these two methods. Okay. Similarly, now this is click stream prepared. Okay. If you see here, I am referring to click stream prepared. So this is the way to set the dependencies. OK, let me just check. Have I got any question? OK, no. Huh. So I also brought to your notice how can we set the expectations. So let me show you and let me take you to the expectations again. Here it is. Expect. With this declaration, I am asking it. You know whether to you know what to do with the tables, uh, what to do with the records which are not meeting this constraint. If those records are not meeting this constraint, what to do with it? Okay, so that that I can define. There are multiple methods available here, which will decide what to do if it gets the record, you know, which has this arrival time missing. It's not null. What to do with the record for which arrival time is missing? So that also we can define. Delta live tables may be combining one or more pipelines to define end-to-end -end transformation. We can create it using Databricks notebook and other things are mentioned there. I will come back to the uh, expectations, you know, uh, to understand them in further details. Okay, first of all, let me check. Uh, what it has done. Uh, yes, it is still waiting for resources. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please go ahead. Uh, 
Just go ahead if you have any question. Yes, it has it has got the resources, sir. and now uh, two worker nodes. I gave the cluster size as two, so two worker nodes it has got, and now it is initializing uh, the things. Initialization is also done, and now it is setting up the tables. Okay. So now it is executing those the steps, and after. Completing the execution of those steps, it will show me the graph of those steps. Streaming tables, materialized review. This is the static uh, data frame, which is of the materialized view. This is streaming table. So nowhere we have mentioned that it is materialized view or it is streaming. You know, looking at the nature of that data frame, it itself is realizing what kind of the table it is. And yes, it is done. If you want to look at every uh, table, you know, here are the details. Okay, there there are total 1,76,791 records in that JSON file. Okay, there are 249 records in the lookup table. Now these 1 lakh 76,000 records have been joined with a static lookup table, you know, and we will get 1,79,000 records again because every record has been joined with some record from the static lookup table. On this, we are applying aggregation. Okay, so after aggregation, count aggregation, we are getting only 70 records. Okay, now of these tables, we can create a materialized views. It has created a materialized view. This this materialized view is variable also. Okay, but uh, and that way we can you now refer to uh, the data uh, it has accumulated into these tables. So here we have seen. Here we have seen how can we use a PySpark to do the same thing. Now let me show you how can we create delta live tables using SQL. So here is a code. See here how we can create this delta live table pipeline using SQL. So here create or refresh live tables and the name. Okay, comment the same comment what I gave in uh, Python code. You know, as a select star from JSON. And here is a path to the JSON files. Here is a path to the JSON files. So thereby I am asking it to create live table. Now, what kind of live table it will create? Because you know it is referring to the dire data directly. It has to create a bronze table. So here it will create a bronze table. Okay. On the bronze table, I want to you know, apply some constraints. Uh, expectations. How we have applied expectations here in this case, you know, we have written expect uh, declaration there. Here you observe expect declaration. How do we apply expectations in case of SQL? There we have to apply them as a constraint. Multiple constraints can be applied over there. Then here we may be doing some kind of uh, uh, here we may be doing some kind of you know, transformation. So data type casting we are doing some column names we are changing. OK, so here we are doing some time uh, some type of transformation also. And here then we are doing some kind of aggregation. So order by. OK, uh, click count. So here we are doing some kind of aggregation. So here you will realize how can we uh, do the same thing using SQL. So in case if 
you are not from Python background, you can do similar things using SQL. So SQL API is also available in case of Delta live table. And this SQL API seems to be simpler compared to Python. The code size is also less. OK, and it is easy to read and understand. OK, but both APIs are available. <coughs> so let me put it to run now. OK, let me create a data pipeline for this. The name is Notebook 220 Delta Live Tables with SQL. So I go here. This pipeline I will have to delete. OK, because I do not have too many SKUs available with me. As two SKUs, eight SKUs, it has reserved uh, for this pipeline. You know, those eight SKUs, I will have to relinquish. So I go here and I delete this pipeline. And I create a new pipeline. <coughs> OK, so I'm creating a new pipeline. Delta Live Table SQL. Delta Live Table SQL. Uh, advanced. OK, from here it is 220. With SQL. 220 with SQL, this one. Select. Uh, notebook 220, Delta Live Tables with SQL. And fine. Uh, here. I will not go with enhanced auto scaling. I will go with a fixed size and let me mention fixed size as two. OK, so that is the cluster size I am declaring. Clicking on create. And this pipeline I have to, you know, uh, start by clicking over the start button. And then <clears throat> again, it will take some time to get the resources. And once it gets the resources, a similar kind of uh, you know, a uh, graph it will create. Now here we are working with a different data set. OK, for this SQL data pipeline, we are working with a different data set and that's why graph will be different. OK, but. A similar uh, kind of thing can be done using SQL. Let me just check have I received any message. OK, uh, Manu Prasad is asking me to share the notebooks. I will have to share the notebooks to uh, Chaitali. OK, Chaitali will share notebooks to all of you. OK, so by end of the, uh, the session, I will share the notebooks with uh, Chaitali. Yes. OK, fine. It has got the resources. Now it is setting the table. And then it will render the graph where I can see the dependencies. OK, and if you look at the code, you know this query. It's referring to. Stream raw. The stream raw is this one. So there, there is a way to set the dependency here. So this query is referring to stream raw. OK, so thereby it will realize that it has this command. It has to run first. 
the order of these commands is not significant here. I mean to say, uh, if I change the order, still this will work. OK, because this is a way to set the dependence. Ideally, the order should be you know, easily understandable to the reader. Okay, but that dependency makes uh, makes it to understand in what you know, uh, the order of the steps to be executed. Step by step, it is already running the things. Let me take you through remaining slides, expectations. An elegant approach to manage data quality. Define data quality constraints. OK, on the data set. And whenever you declare the constraint on the data set, it understands you know, what are the uh, steps to be applied on the data. OK, and those constraints will decide uh, the approach to enhance the data quality and it gives you quality data ready. Can be defined using decoration. Okay, this is called as a decoration. Okay, all the steps have got executed here. This is called as a decoration. This one is a decoration. This one is a decoration. This one is a decoration. So you mentioned decoration in Python code and you mentioned constraint, which is equivalent to decoration, you know, in uh, SQL. So here is the constraint. This is the way to declare a decoration. Or expectations in SQL. Okay, so it got completely executed, and that's how your pipeline gets executed. Let us uh, try to understand more on expectations, but before I um, go for the expectations, let me just delete this pipeline because this pipeline has created a cluster of nodes which I need to relinquish. I'm deleting it. Huh. Mm. OK. Data quality metrics can be observed by using querying delta live tables event log. Here is the event. I think I deleted it. OK, but otherwise there is an event log shown. From there also, uh, data quality metrics can be observed. Define expectation to retain records that fail validation. Okay, drop records that fail validation. See here. Uh, yes, here. Expect. It retains the records which are not, you know, meeting this requirement. So the records which are Failing the validations, which are not failing the validations, all records are retained if you are uh, giving the decoration as expectation. Expect. Okay, but there are, you know, uh, methods or decorations here, they are listed. DLT expect retain invalid records also. DLT expect or drop. Drop invalid records. Here it will drop the records which are not meeting the validation. OK, so here you have to decide whether you want to pass on the records, invalid records to the next step that you can decide. Fail on invalid records. Whenever it realizes that record is invalid, you know, it will terminate the process. It will terminate the execution of the pipeline. OK, so multiple such methods are available to decide whether to, you want to retain the invalid records, whether you want to drop invalid records, 
or whether you have to terminate the pipeline when it encounters invalid records. In constraint, expect on violation drop rows, on violation uh, on violation fail update. These kinds of uh, you know, reservoirs are available here. Okay, C on violation fail update. On violation, now when I mention expect only, okay, it will retain invalid records. But if I do not want it to retain invalid records, I will mention on violation drop rules. Okay, so that way, expectations also can be declared. So, okay, we have had a look at. Uh, SQL approach to create a data live table. We have had a look at a Python approach to create a data live table. And before that, we also had an approach uh, of creating delta tables using uh, PySpark. So all the three ways here we tried. Okay, so so uh, just to recall the things, what we have done, OK, I brought to your notice that. Uh, how these things got evolved and what were the problems in uh, earlier solution? OK, because of which industry needed the next solution. So flat file system was not able to search the records. OK, so RDBMS got introduced. RDBMS was able to search the record and deal with the transactions, but was not able to deal with the different data formats and uh, data types. OK, so then they introduced something called as the data lake, what's capable of you know, dealing with different data types and data formats. OK, so then uh, they introduced a big data uh, processing. OK, but in big data processing, stream processing was not possible. You know, uh, it would make uh, dealing with the different data formats and data types possible, but stream processing was not possible. So in Spark, then batch and stream processing was possible, but architecture was difficult and and the data constraint you know, was not reliable. And then they introduced the lake house where batch and stream processing possible. Architecture is simple. Implementation is simple. Transaction management is also possible. And it gave me unification of data warehouse and big data processing. And there we saw delta live tables, sorry, delta tables and delta live tables. And we saw the implementation also. OK, it is time for us to. Discuss the questions now. Can we implement delta live tables in? Synapse. Yes, we can. Uh, now in Synapse, they have given different API. Means PySpark API is little bit different in Synapse. Here in Databricks, you know, there is a different API. Okay, in Databricks, if you see, we have to create a checkpoints. You know, there is a different way to create checkpoint in the PySpark. OK, but otherwise these steps work there also. These steps work there also. So yes, it is possible. There are some API uh, level changes. Those you will have to understand before you do implementation, but otherwise. Until to. Uh, since six months, they have introduced a recent version of Spark over there. OK, and now the Delta table Delta table implementation is possible there also. I'm not sure about delta live tables, but delta, uh, cha -cha, can you we implement delta live tables in Synapse? No, I'm not sure about delta live tables. I think that that feature is yet to come, but delta tables are possible. OK. Any other question?
Okay, in case if you do not have questions, please uh, fill up the feedback form. Okay, feedbacks are very important for us. And would like to see all of you in uh, next session. Chaitali has shared a link of feedback to you. Okay, and in available time of two hours, you know, I try to cover uh, too many things. Okay, like, uh, you know, delta live tables in order to 